here today with Steve Sutherland, who is the CEO of Konami Gaming. And Steve, we haven't spoken in quite a while. So uh, first of all, thank you for taking this time. No, absolutely, Frank. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And yes, it's been a little bit of time, so it would be good to catch up. Great. Well, given it's been so long, uh, maybe you can just give us a quick overview of what um, what's transpired at Konami in the past year or so and, and your plans for the, say, the near future. Okay. Frank, I mean, you know, just, you know, just to summarize, as we were going into the uh, pandemic, Konami had, um, was commencing to release its new Dimension Series product line. In the antenna that was repositioning the company to go into areas such as premium participation and looking at the other markets, um, such as, you know, the video lottery terminal market, class two, and um, ultimately, and actually what had um, arisen um, immediately during those pandemic era was historical horse racing. So where we're at today, uh, we have successfully entered the historical horse racing. Here recently, um, at the end of June, and actually on July 6th, I had dinner at uh, Saratoga uh, Casino and Hotel, we had successfully entered the VLT market in New York State. And that was a test case. And here shortly here, uh, this quarter, we will enter the class two gaming space. We're just waiting to get through all our own um, internal testing with the New York State Lottery. And then we'll uh, release those personnel to focus on um, entering the class two gaming space here shortly. Well, there's probably not a nicer place to be in July than Saratoga, New York. <laughs> One of, one of the most beautiful places in the world, and it's in my backyard, you know, where I grew up. So um, I'm used to seeing that, seeing that, and it was good to get back there, uh, particularly this time of year. It is beautiful. I, I do have to tell you, one of the coldest evenings I've ever spent in my life, however, was a March in Sar March night in Saratoga, New York. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand. I still maintain a home in uh, upstate New York. I actually love the cold and enjoy that. So beautiful place to be, but it does get very cold. Well, it, it's kind of an aside, but as you know, as we discussed before, upstate New York is one of my favorite parts of the world. I think it's one of America's best kept secrets. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I know that the VGT, the VLT uh, entry into New York is big for Konami. So perhaps you can elaborate a little bit. Yes. Um, as we take a look at entering um, New York State, um, the key component was is we've had efforts in the past to enter the video lottery terminal market in Canada. Unfortunately, we came upon the pandemic. During the pandemic, New York State um, had issued an RFP for entry into that marketplace. We had people working that market ahead of time to learn about that. And so we decided we would uh, respond to the RFP. And, you know, we were, you know, awarded, you know, a 10 percent, you know, floor share space within that market. Um, and so we took advantage of it. Uh, we developed in that arena. We did the appropriate protocol to connect with the New York State lottery system. And we just launched, you know, the new Dimension Series product. There are successfully two game contents. We have a few issues, uh, very, very minor issues to connect, you know, uh, you know, connectivity type things, very small issues related to the lottery. Those, um, you know, are in effect completed. And so we're now at the point where we're looking to install further within that market outside um, the Saratoga Casino and Hotel on top of adding incremental product within that property itself. So New York is, is important, not just for being New York, but for what it portends that you can do elsewhere in those markets throughout the country. Correct. I mean, there, there's an awful lot you learn with your uh, first uh, go live experience. And you can take that forward into the other, you know, video lottery terminal markets, be it in Canada 
or the United States, those personnel, those R&D personnel can leverage that experience to enter those other markets, uh, including, I mean, if you want to enter, you know, states such as, um, you know, in Illinois, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunity, you know, on the forefront for Konami in that arena. One of the uh, challenges that almost every industry faces today are supply chain disruptions. How well is Konami Gaming managing those? And, and I noticed that you recently appointed a manager uh, for, the, for supply chain and purchasing. And tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, as I think all our, all the uh, suppliers in the industry, they've all experienced to a degree some major supply chain issues. And it's typically at the um, electronic component level. Um, and with that, um, we, we've had some major disruptions. And what's been happening, it's like playing whack-a-mole. I mean, for those who remember the game is, you know, something rears its head and we as executive management, we need to address that. You get that one component address and all of a sudden you're on to something else. So typically what it leads to is a redesign of boards, okay, to get into more readily available chipsets here in the U.S. or available in the U.S. or, you know, based, even if they're coming from Asia. So, you know, we have successfully maneuvered through it. I feel much more comfortable this quarter with, um, you know, the actions we've put in place. It did have impact on the company to a degree where we had to make decisions as to, are we going to ship more direct sale product versus participation product or trial product, et cetera. But I think we're, we've successfully overcome that. We're coming out of that this quarter. So um, our factory's ramping up, the inventory's starting to flow in. So I feel much uh, um, better position than where we were for about six months. Um, I think what, um, you know, Konami is with other suppliers, when you have to go out to the open market to sh secure chips, the cost of those chips are much, much more there are a very significant multiple if you're getting those direct directly from the supplier versus those that have you know taken um, gone out and secured uh, major chipsets they have them in their warehouse looking for opportunities such as this where they can leverage pricing you know with other third-party companies and as we take a look at the supply chain you have to understand who we're competing with you know we're competing with the likes of a ford motor company general motors Chrysler, et cetera, for certain chipsets, you know, the gaming industry buys hundreds of thousands of chips. When you go there, they're buying millions and millions of chips. And on top of that, I think, you know, with the, what hap what's happened in Eastern Europe with Ukraine, I think some of those chipsets are also being secured under, you know, War Powers Act, Act type things, where those chipsets are, you know, going to DOD contractors, et cetera, that need to build up, you know, certain systems, you know, in support of the U.S. government's efforts, um, you know, in those countries. But I think we've successfully maneuvered through that today. The young gentleman that we brought on board, he is focused in IT and technology. Uh, we, he's a welcome addition um, to the team. And I think he can uh, lend some, you know, additional value to us going forward. I met with him this past Friday for the first time because I've been out of town for a few weeks. Um, Great conversation. Um, his thought processes are in, al are in alignment with the executive management team on actions that we need to take. So I think he's quick study and that he can assist us also. Do you see some uh, foreseeable normality returning to the industry like three months or six months or a year from now? Frank, I think uh, for things to settle in, we're at least another year out and uh, we have to be we have to pay very close attention to supply chain, not only in our games business and systems business, that, that's that been impacted also. You know, an, an item I never thought that would rise, uh, um, you know, to my level that needed to be addressed was escalated last week and we're addressing that today. It was probably one of the last items I ever expected to, you know, rise on the horizon. It, we appear to have a good grasp on it, but something that's typically been available eight, 12 weeks out, they're now saying it can go out to 18 months here shortly. 
So, you know, of course, we're back in the redesign phase on certain components, et cetera, and we'll address that also. Fortunately, the redesign on this component is much easier than your mainline processor boards and electronics, et cetera. One of the more exciting developments in the United States over the past couple of years has been the proliferation of online gaming, online casino, as well as online sports betting. You know, sports betting tends to get most of the headlines in the, in the general right. press. Uh, how important do you believe online gaming will be to Konami and your competitors? The, the the online gaming is very critical to Konami. We entered that marketplace, um, I, I'd say 48 to 60 months ago. We have a very material business, you know, in that environment, and we continue to invest. Um, Konami operates its own remote game server with, you know, content, and we have some great customers at Arena. So through that RGS, uh, we do both social gaming and real money gaming, and we have some great customer sets, you know, in that arena. And we will continue to invest in that arena going forward. It's a great place to leverage the content that we've developed for the class three uh, marketplace. I think there's a few things we, um, there's some learnings that we've made in the social gaming space where we may need to do some things a little bit more unique on top of that versus the real money gaming. But at least, you know, we have that data and that information coming back, uh, you know, through our relationship with the customers. So, you know, you know, we look forward to growing in that business. And here recently, you know, we're looking to take that effort more offshore. And what I mean by that, our focus has really been more the North American marketplace over the past years. But there's fertile ground in Europe and other areas, uh, particularly, you know, real money gaming, et cetera, where it's, you know, legal. And our regulatory compliance departments are comfortable with the direction we're going in. So good opportunity for us. You know, we have some great partners and we, we look forward to continuing to support them and future customers that, um, you know, we engage with. One of the things that we've talked about over the years <clears throat> is that with a parent company, that's a consumer entertainment company that has brought a lot of value to Konami gaming. I'm assuming the same thing holds true in the online, the world of online gaming, both gambling and, and non-gambling. Right. Uh, it, basically, if I take a look at the other two entities, be it at, uh, Konami Digital Entertainment or Konami Amusement, okay, we, we have more so just license content and very specific things from them that, you know, we place in the field. So it's been more of a licensing type type of opportunity. Both those businesses operate in that social gaming space significantly, and they've been very successful. We've developed our own uh, platforms, you know, remote, you know, RGSs, remote game servers, relationship-wise, et cetera. But we're more of a consumer from that standpoint of content um, that we license from them versus technology. It doesn't mean that there's not a play in the future. Um, and, you know, those are things I you know, kind of hold, you know, close to the vest, but there is that opportunity, you know, as technology arises. Um, at the same point in time, Konami Digital Entertainment um, does operate successfully in the esports arena, as you can understand with all the content that they have in that arena. They've been a consumer from us more based on legalities of going into certain jurisdictions. So there is um, open dialogue, okay, between the companies we engage there. Um, is there an opportunity to play to consolidate some of those things in the future? Absolutely. You know, current corporate structure, you have to understand, uh, you know, the Konami Group is more of a holding company. So we license um, technologies, contents, you know, amongst each other. But it doesn't mean there's not a future play here. You know, it is we look at the future, you know, of the, um, the Internet, the iGaming space. Well, I should think that as you compete 
against other uh, gaming industry, meaning gambling industry right. companies, that all those resources from the Konami Digital and the other entities within the Konami uh, group uh, do provide you with a lot of advantages competitively. Uh, that, that, that is correct, Frank. And we've had customers that have engaged us that um, have uh, been looking at eSports type opportunities and stuff. We, we can uh, right now be more a coordination of meetings, you know, between the divisions ourselves and the customer. Um, you know, down the road, it doesn't mean that uh, we may not get more proactively involved in doing, um, you know, a more cohesive effort and uh, a, a merchandising approach, you know, to the customer base. One of the um, buzzwords, if that's the right word, it might not be over the past year or two, has been cashless gaming. And we know that Konami has been a pioneer in actually implementing cashless gaming uh, at Resorts World Las Vegas. Uh, and we've also heard recently some concerns from different parties that the adoption of cashless gaming is going a little more slowly than some had anticipated it would. Can you fill us in a little bit, both where the industry is and also where Konami is? Yes. Um, Frank, as we take a look, the cashless technology um, that we first implemented has been around for eight years. Um, you know, we operate significantly in the cruise ship industry that operates in a cashless environment and very successfully. And, and there have been casinos in the past that have been 100% cashless, um, you, know, you know, going back many years. If we take a look at where we are today, cashless adoption, okay, I, I think a few things has to happen. You know, the cashless adoption at Resorts World, I think, was generally successful. But as we take a look for the industry, an industry acceptance standpoint, it's got to be 100% seamless, okay? There's got to be no friction. It needs to meet the patron's requirements, et cetera. So, you know, in many cases, you take a look at some of the other generations coming in. They use Venmo, okay? They use PayPal. They use Zelle seamlessly. They're linked to their bank accounts, et cetera. I think there's a number of frictions there based on between regulations, potentially, you know, even in the banking system to go to that level. And I'll step back to 1983 when I moved to Southern California. I was part of a, a program with the Bank of America, something called ATMs. There was 500 customers, okay in one of the cities in Southern California. Um, it, it was a wonderful experience versus the long lines, you know, drive through lane, lanes, et cetera. They did put a little bit of friction in. Uh, unfortunately, they put the ATM in the same line as, um, you, know, you know, going to the drive through. But once they did that, they had broader and broader acceptance. So I think today we, we need to get the technology very similar to what we see in some of the cruise line applications, it's 100% seamless. It's easy for the patron to do their transactions. You don't want to be going through multiple steps. So the industry, will it adopt? Yes, it's going to take some time. We're, we're probably a few years out. Um, I think it's very similar to, you know, ticket in, ticket out. We saw, um, when I came in the industry in the mid '90s, that MGM had a, um, you know, a, a ticket area. Um, unfortunately, it was only on very specific machines at that point in time. But when California legalized, Southern California or the California, the Native American tribes had a, you know, ticket in, ticket out technology. Once that was implemented in Southern California, those patrons came here. We made it frictionless. And the industry saw the benefit. The adoption was over a couple year period. So I think we're probably a few years out, but we have to make sure that all the barriers from a regulatory standpoint um, or, you know, self-imposed restrictions, you know, um, those frictions are taken away today. To me, today, you know, I take a look at, you know, the cashless environment. Um, do I utilize it? Yes, when I'm certain areas, 
there's a number of friction points I'd like to see go away. So I can just get it linked directly to my bank account. You know, I'll take responsibility for myself from a gambling standpoint, and that money can flow back and forth. I, I, I'm not a fan of multiple steps, that's myself. And I think a lot of the generations coming in, they don't like that either. And I think you get into certain age demographics, um, you start putting those additional barriers, having to, you know, do things. I think that creates another friction point. So it's not going to be readily adopted immediately. So be a little patient, but it will happen. I believe we'll see it in the next five years. I'm confident in that. We, we've covered a lot of ground, Steve, and I thank you for your, your generosity in sharing your time. Uh, anything else you would like folks to know about Konami Gaming? No, you know, Frank, I, I think the key thing is, is we owe our success um, you know, to the customer base. We never forget about them. Um, you know, we pay very close attention to our product performance, be class three, you know, on our recent entry in the historical horse racing, um, you know, the, the video lottery terminal market. We owe them a lot of thanks, you know, in that arena. And on the other side, I really didn't say much about our systems business. Our systems business continues to grow materially um, month after month, you know, which, which is a very good sign. And, um, you know, the customer base is widely adopted in our SYNC 31, which is our anti-money laundering product. And we've had very, very significant success. We call it our kinetic employee apps. It's really, you know, to enhance the player experience, you know, so the casino personnel can service that patron, be it a jackpot or other items that need to be addressed immediately on the floor today. So... And with that, um, you know, I look forward to seeing you and your group at uh, G2E just as much as I look forward to seeing, you know, our customer base that uh, I don't get to see as often as I used to because of my current role within the company. So it's a great time to reconnect with the industry. And I'll be down in Australia here um, next week. I'll be attending AG, so we'll get to reconnect with those customers there post-pandemic wise, first time in a long time. Well, we look forward to seeing you at G2E and all the, the new products that Konami will unveil. Uh, Steve, thanks very much for your time and for your insights. All right. Thank you, Frank.